Hi everyone, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yep. Okay. Uh, first of all, thanks for joining the event. And um, I'm just going to request the people who are joining from online, please unmute yourself. If you are not talking, keep just mute. And we are going to, it's very sort of like informal, conversation in between Jason and me. And through the conversation, we will try to let you know our journey from different perspective and how we started our journey as a student. And also we are going to talk about a few great success of Jason Jones. Um, I don't think I don't need to introduce Jason Jones because all of you already know him. Uh, Jason. Oh, somebody said they don't. Sorry. Do, do a little intro. Yeah, yeah, of course. <laughs> like, Jason is um, human rights and LGBT defenders from Trinidad and Tobago. And his life is full of success. I'm going to highlight one of the successful um, incident from his life, which is in, uh, he owned the case uh, from Trinidad and Tobago and decriminalized homosexuality in this country in um, 2018. And which means uh, 100,000 people from Caribbeans like get the freedom. So that's, uh, I think Jason here deserves a big claps from all of us for this great achievement. Um, Jason, we sort of know that you started your activism four decades before when you started landed in London as a student. And um, as far as I know, you participated the uh, March, uh, I mean, 28 section. So as a student, um, how did you connect it? And do you mind telling about that a little bit more? Great, thanks, Vaz. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, so starting off as a student, I first came to London in 1985 um, from Trinidad and Tobago, where I was born in 1964. Um, I have dual citizenship. My mother is white English and my father is black Trinidadian. So I have dual citizenship. So that allowed me to come to London in, in 1985. Um, but it was predominantly to pursue a career in the arts. I had worked in the arts in Trinidad, studied as a theater practitioner for three years with some of the most famous Caribbean theater, theatrical people in the world, Derek Walcott, I worked with, uh, Helen Camps, who you won't know, but is a very famous director in the Caribbean, um, Earl Warner from Barbados, Hank John from Suriname. Um, I trained under all of these people and uh, came to London to pursue the dream of going into the theater. Um, and Obviously, there was a huge amount of homophobia against anybody who presented effeminately or anywhere outside of the normal masculine identities that Caribbean people have. And of course, you know, the Caribbean is a kind of microcosm of colonialism. So you, you take the machismo that you see in the global north, and then you multiply it by like a thousand times. <laughs> so if you were not playing football, if you were not you know, doing the butch stuff, if you cried at certain movies, if you liked dancing in the ballet like I did, um, that put you on the hit list of nearly everybody, including my brother. My brother used to beat me up for my perceived homosexuality. Um, I didn't even know what homosexuality was, but I was being accused of it. So when I was 14, my parents, who were both journalists, my mother was a print journalist from London, and my father was a television journalist. He was actually the first ever black news reader on television in the entire global south. From Miami, go back down, he was the first black man. My father trained Trevor McDonald. English people would know Trevor yeah, McDonald. Yeah. So Trevor McDonald was trained oh, wow. by my father in Trinidad. Wow. So I grew up with these two very powerful communicators who were both journalists and obviously had many queer friends themselves. So when I was 14, they sat me down and explained 
what was happening to me. You know, it's astonishing to be accused of something and you don't even know what you're being accused of because you're 14 years old and you're not sexually active and uh, those kinds of conversations don't happen. You're just accused of the crime. So uh, from the age of 14, my parents outed me. And uh, from that point on, that kind of gave me a lot of freedom because my parents accepted me as a queer man, queer, queer teenager. And that allowed me to pursue careers that uh, were deemed uh, <laughs> unw un unworthy for, for the average man. And um, the homophobic bullying in Trinidad was uh, hard to describe. Um, I remember one night being at a gay bar and we got locked into the gay bar. Lopes, we have a Trini in the audience who might remember Lopes, um, was, was a very famous uh, underground gay bar in Port of Spain. And we were in there one night and uh, somebody came running in and blood streaming down their face. They had just been attacked by a group of guys in the street and those guys were now coming up to the building to beat everybody in the building. So we locked ourselves in and had to be escorted out by the police. But it didn't stop there. It wasn't just being locked in for two hours with the building being stoned and pelted by a, a mob of homophobic thugs. Um, while being escorted outside by the police, a policeman escorted me to my car and whispered in my ear, I know who your father is. So I then had blackmail on top of the threat of violence. So that's how bad homophobia is in countries that still criminalize LGBT people. Um, I'll go on to more detail about criminalization and the history of it as we go on. But um, I think that answers a bit about how I got here. <laughs> yeah, definitely you did. And we can see that in 1992, again, you went back to Trinidad and Tobago and you sort of like co-founded the first LGBT organization in uh, like um, Trinidad and Tobago. And could you mind telling us about uh, like setting a group like in a country where homosexuality is illegal and what sort of strategy did you take? And um, just <coughs> if you'd let us know, that would be good. So, the timeline is, I came in 1985 and I started chasing around theater. It wasn't happening. Nobody knew how to cast a mixed race man. I mean, in those days, mixed race was not a thing. So, you know, I got very high up. I got um, <clears throat> cast in uh, Miss Saigon. I did a musical on Martin Luther King's life, which was fantastic, <clears throat> but um, it never really panned out. And then in 1988, uh, Margaret Thatcher, the then prime minister and head of the Conservative Party passed something called Section 28. That's a very important thing, if those of you taking note. Um, Section 28 was a law passed by the Conservative government in the United Kingdom that criminalized the promotion of homosexuality within any government resource. So no government resources or government resource space could promote asexuality. So, for example, you couldn't have the play bent put on in university. You couldn't have uh, teachers speaking about homosexuality in schools. So if your student came up to you and had questions about homosexuality, you were not allowed to, to speak to them. And this was right across the board, everything. Libraries couldn't stop books. Everything stopped dead. And uh, at that point, because you know, I came to try out to study theater. You know, the last thing I'm thinking is to become an activist. But I was studying uh, actually here at the University of London, Birkbeck College. I was doing uh, a, 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 a degree in, oh my God, this was the first time, I forget what it's called. It was called Contemporary Black Arts and Theatre at Birkbeck College. I dropped out, so don't worry. <laughs> but um, <clears throat> it was a period in London where, well, the UK, where everybody became very galvanized about LGBT rights. I mean, up until that point, the only LGBT rights we had was decriminalization that happened partially in England and Wales in 1967. So <clears throat> when she passed this law, when Margaret Thatcher passed this law, LGBT people became very vocal and very active and, uh, about advocacy for LGBT rights. And there were a lot of um, anti-Section 28 marches in Central London, which I then became very involved with. And I started one of the first LGBT organizations here at University of London 
to join those marches. And that's when I became an activist. So, you know, one of the things that I, I would point out at this point is activism is really driven by desperation. I always tell people, most people come to activism from desperation, not inspiration. And that's one of the problems with activism today. All of it is desperate. It doesn't come from an inspired place. You don't see courses in universities like this on how to be an activist. Nobody tells you, oh, you can take your country to court. You know, these are things that we are not taught as civilians. So um, I joined all these marches, became very active on the anti-section 28 marches. And then in 1992, I went home on a holiday ended up staying for three years, fell back in love with my country and realized things were not progressing. And I'd done all this stuff uh, for Section 28 in Trinidad in London. So I thought in Trinidad that, you know, we should be doing something similar. And I was part of a group that created the first LGBT organization in Trinidad, the Lambda Group in 1992. Unfortunately, the group fell apart in the next two years because uh, over 50% of our board died from HIV AIDS. Um, Trinidad has the distinction, the dubious distinction, of having the, high, the second highest mortality rate from HIV AIDS in the world, second only to New York City. We lost hundreds and hundreds of gay men. Uh, why? Uh, because Trinidad at that point was very oil rich. So flying up to New York City for a dirty gay weekend was very easy for a lot of gay men. And unfortunately, the very sad dog souvenir they brought back with them was HIV AIDS. So we had the second highest mortality rate per capita in the world. So um, in 1992, we founded Lambda um, predominantly to fight this, this issue about, around HIV AIDS. Um, and unfortunately, it fell apart when most of the board died. That's thanks to Yes. Thank you. So later we found that like in 1996, again, you came back to London and then the real journey started, which has not finished yet. <laughs> and there is long way to go still. So do you mind telling us about your, especially the winning the case in Trinidad and Tobago? And I would like to know, <coughs> Sort of like what sort of challenges you face us and what sort of strategy you have taken to overcome those challenges. Thank you. So in 1992, I spent three years in Trinidad. During that three years, I met a partner. Um, and in 1996, my mother passed away in London. So I said to him, well, you know, my mom left the house, we can come to London and spend two years. They had something then called a young person's Commonwealth visa, which allowed uh, Commonwealth citizens under the age of 29 to come to Britain to visit the mother country for two years. You could work for one year and travel around for the next year. So I said, well, we can do the two year young person's Commonwealth visa and then come back home to Trinidad because I had made up my mind I was gonna stay in Trinidad in fact. Anyway, we got, to uh, London and within three months, he said, I don't wanna go back home. I feel so comfortable here. I feel like our relationship is respected here. I feel uh, we can go to a gay club. We can go to the grocery store. I mean, we used to be falling ar around the grocery stores in London, in Trinidad because gay, two gay men shopping was a huge deal in Trinidad. So um, I said, well, listen, you know, there's no way to do it, you know? I don't know how we can do it. So he took it upon himself and he found this organization called the Stonewall Immigration Group, who were fighting for the rights of the overseas partner to get landed residency based on a de facto relationship of cohabitation. Now, this was a law that was allowed to straight couples, straight unmarried couples, who had been together for four years cohabitating, two years under, under the same roof cohabitating. Even though they were not married, the overseas partner could get residency. And then five years of residency would give them permanent uh, residency and then a British passport. So this organization was saying, well, listen, give it to unmarried queer couples. You know, you're giving it to straights, give it to us. And we, I then joined the board of Stonewall Immigration Group and we lobbied. We did a lot of backdoor lobbying with the then Labour Party who were in opposition. And we said, listen, 
this next election, 1997, this is, if we give you votes, you need to give us this, because this is not a major thing. This is not about changing laws. This is just inserting same-sex couples into a already existing legislation. So this is dead easy for you to do. And lo and behold, Labour Party comes to a landslide victory into power, and three months later, they pass the legislation. Um, this was the, my partner and I were one of 40 test cases that were challenging the law at the time. Both our passports were taken by the Home Office. We could not travel, and every 28 days, we'd get a letter saying, get the F out of our country, um, and then we would apply again. That went on for a year and a half until we won and, and the Labour Party changed the laws. So um, me and my partner were one of 40 gay and lesbian couples that challenged that law. And this was the first ever gay legislation passed in this country post decriminalization 30 years previous. So I am the only person on the planet who has changed the laws in two countries mm. for LGBT <laughs> rights. Um, that law was also hugely important because these 40 couples had to supply to the Home Office proof of cohabitation under the same roof for four years. So we had a pile this big of like our rent, love letters, letters from family, pictures of us on holiday. You know, you had to show that you were together and living under the same roof. And uh, that led to the government realizing, wait a minute, they're not just people having sex in bushes and, you know, they actually form loving together households. And this was the groundwork that led to what was then called civil registry. They said, okay, well, fine, we're now recognizing that, that you all have committed loving relationships. Now, I know this sounds insane to you now, but this was the thinking back then. They did not think gay people could have loving long-term relationships. So because we had these 40 cases as proof of four years of loving cohabitation, um, they then said, okay, we're going to do a test. We're going to do a thing called civil registry. And they took six towns around the United Kingdom, uh, Brighton, where me and my partner were then living, Brighton, Manchester, Birmingham, I want to say Glasgow, I forget the other two. Um, and you could go into the town hall and register your partnership, and you'd get a little certificate saying the two of you are in a loving relationship, blah, 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 meant nothing. It wasn't with the paper it was on. But it was just important for them to see what the take-up would be on same-sex relationships being registered. From that, it then went to civil partnership, which was all, everything but, but the word marriage. Once you say the M word, you know those Hetis lose their minds. So we had civil partnership, which was equivalent to marriage. And then of course, marriage equality followed, uh, I think about 15 years later. So what I'm trying to paint a picture for you, and I'm sure Matt is doing with his great questions, is to show you the progression of the work that this has been 35 years of my work and it doesn't happen overnight and it's been incremental. And for example, when I took on the case to challenge a law in Trinidad, you know, I knew that case would take 10 years. I knew it, not because of any reason, except this was the times of each court. If you go to the high court in Trinidad, that takes two years. You then go to the appeal court of Trinidad and Tobago. Well, for me, it's taken five years, but we're gonna kick off two, take off two because of the, pandemic. And then the Privy Council, which is our Supreme Court, which is here in London, that will take a further three years. So it takes 10 years to decriminalize a country through the court system. So uh, fast forward, I've divorced the husband, and uh, or he divorced me. And uh, I then uh, went home again, uh, and I realized that uh, I had a 10 year gap of not going home. I'd written off home. My brother was homophobic. My family were homophobic. I just thought, I have no future here whatsoever. I went home on a holiday, and my brother said, your nieces and nephews don't know who this mysterious uncle is living in Europe. So I said, well, you know, I can visit, you know. So I visited, and it was astonishing how nothing had changed for a decade. Absolutely nothing. And people were still dying of AIDS. And I'm just like, what the hell? You know, this is a time war. So I thought, okay, you need to do something. So I went... I went back home and I started a new LGBT organization because the one that was there did not believe in, in de decriminalization litigation. That was for two reasons. One, they were stupid. Two, 
we have something built into our constitution as a former colony of Britain called a savings law clause. The savings law clause insulates all laws that predate our independence. So all British colonial era laws are saved. You cannot challenge them in a court of law. Death penalty, buggery home, driving bareback, running goats through the town, you know, the most insane things. You cannot challenge in a court of law. So this LG, the largest LGBT organization said, well, we can litigate, you know, forget it. They just close their minds off. I said, there has to be a way. So I said to lawyers here in London, because, you know, th this is the great thing about having a foot in both place. And, you know, one of the powerful things about be being mixed race and binational is the fact that I have a, a foot in, in both places. And I, I don't have a close mind. You know, there, there's all these very famous statements about when somebody lives in a, in a bird that lives in a cage, you know, thinks flying is crazy. You know, so you have to understand that activists in these countries, they have no vision of what freedom is. You know, the freedom you enjoy in Europe, for somebody living in a country there that has criminalization, you cannot imagine how close off their minds is to this kind of freedom, you know? So um, I spoke to a lot of lawyers and they said, no, Jason, there's no way you can do it. I spoke to a uh, <laughs> constitutional lawyer in Trinidad. No, Jason, I teach constitutional law. You can't do it. So I found this gay lawyer young gay man he wasn't even a uh, barrister he was doing he was still doing his uh studies and uh, i said to him listen there has to be a way i said okay friend let's sit down and go through this and he found a way he found a loophole and the loophole was this so in 1962 we became independent from britain and that entire constitution and the british buggery law is now saved cannot be touched it's ring fenced in 1976 we became a republic the original constitution is now transferred into Republican status, but they also carried over the savings law clause. So it's still ring fenced. In 1986, they went into the buggery law and they extended the jail time by 10 years. It was five years under the Brits. My parliamentarians, my black and Indian parliamentarians extended the jail time by 10 years. They then in 2000 went into the buggery act again extended it another 10 years and then created the equal opportunity act 2000 and in that act they expressly denied protections for any discrimination based on your sexual orientation or gender identity so gee they wrote that into an equal opportunity act so my lawyer said well listen if you went into the the act twice extending jail time creating new laws oh and i forgot one other thing in 1986, they also created Section 16, the Serious Indecency Act, which criminalized lesbians, because they thought it wasn't good enough to criminalize the homosexual men. Let's go after the lesbians as well. So they created Serious Indecency that had a five-year jail term. So my lawyer said, listen, if they went into it, it's no longer saved. We must challenge this. And that's how I challenged it. And in 2018, a judge agreed, and I won decriminalization for both gay men and lesbians. Wow. Well done. And this is interesting that like still um, all the like uh, we have got like 69 countries around the world where uh, like still homosexual is illegal and half of these countries are from Africa and Commonwealth countries and this law was implemented by like it originated from Bagari Act and implemented by the British Emperor when they like uh, ruled the world. So, from me, I would like to know your point of view. Like, there is a Commonwealth organization, LGBT organization, who is helping all those countries. So, what strategy? should take all those Commonwealth uh, organization at the same time, do you think the British government have really good part to play to abolish the, especially the law from the Commonwealth countries? Um, I think it's important to break that down into three parts. Number one, the history of colonialism. 
yeah. especially their French students here, right? So what you need to understand is the difference between British colonialism and French colonialism and the history of decriminalization. The French actually never had a law that criminalized homosexuality directly. They had kind of a weird kind of, you know, if you're kind of sexually deviant, but it wasn't very specific. So when the French colonized, they didn't have a law to carry over. And also the French colonization was very different from British colonization. British colonization was about molding the colonies into a form of Britain. So you will hear places like Barbados being called Little England, you know? They, they, they tried to force their values and their systems and their culture onto their colonized people. Whereas French colonization was very different. French would go into a country and embrace what was happening there. So when you had, for example, the secular in the Caribbean, which was the transfer of power between colonizers. So Spain was now in decline and it sold off to Britain a lot of its former colonies. For example, Trinidad and Tobago. Um, I think this secular happened in 17... Don't come at me. But anyway, look out for the secular. Um, at that point, you also had the French Revolution, which was also a big turning point on how sexuality was dealt with in the former colonies. So you had a lot of very wealthy French people who owned colonies in the Caribbean, escaping the, the guillotine in France, going out to their plantations, and of course being bored as hell. And then they started to get involved with black culture of their slaves because the slaves had a very vibrant culture. And we had a period uh, between our plantation cycle, uh, between what is now Christmas and what is now Lent. Um, that period was where nothing was happening. You were cycling over. So the land was being turned, being prepared for a new crop to be planted. And in that little gap was where carnival exploded in these col colonies, um, New Orleans down through the Caribbean. And the French loved that whole thing because, you know, they're like bored rich people and they're looking at what's going on in the slave camp and they're going, oh, you know, hey, bring them up to the big house, let's all have a car. <laughs> so French was very important in exploding that slave culture and that carnival culture. And that meshing also happened sexually. So you will hear of a class of people in, Trin in Trinidad called French Creoles. And these are people who have uh, French and black blood. Um, they don't define themselves as black. Nobody does in the Caribbean anymore except the black power people. But it, it created another underclass of people in the Caribbean. And that also was what created this kind of weird dichotomy of sexual freedom within French colonization. Whereas British colonization was absolutely opposite. You would never have British plantocracy mixing with slavery at all. I mean, they may go down there secretly, but there was no kind of proper cultural meshing. So the difference of colonizing is very key to looking at how these laws still permeate in, this, in the countries that we see. So out of the out of these 69 countries that criminalized, 33 are former colonies of Britain. And the majority of them are African and Caribbean. Majority are black. And the majority of those countries are Christian. So they either have Roman Catholic uh, or uh, Anglican uh, majorities. Right? So that was also another big part of it. You know, the French didn't bring a lot of religion with them. You know, religion for the French is a very kind of keep that to yourself, you know, do it in private. Whereas the British are just like, kumbaya, everybody get in a circle and you're, you're singing with us. So that all built this, uh, um, what you see today where French former colonies don't have these laws, but British colonies do. And then of course the other countries that, that criminalize are majority Muslim countries. So it's, it's all based on those two religions, Christianity, and Muslim faiths are the main culprits of homophobia. And any other points was? Yes, I just wanted to know your point of view. I mean, sort of like what sort of strategy the Commonwealth um, LGBT organization should take or like 
Do you have any advice for them? Yeah, I think the strategy is shit. And I think we have been failing um, as a queer community across the globe for the last 20 years. I think that LGBT activism has been dominated by white, gay, and lesbian, cisgender, middle-class, tertiary educated people. And they come into advocacy blinkered. They come into it with a heteronormative vision of what queer identity should look like. So let's fight for marriage equality. Um, why? <laughs> Do you know why is that your focus when there are 69 countries that still criminalize us? But the white people are here, the white queers here, are all fighting for marriage equality. They're all fighting to have kids. They're all fighting to replicate patriarchy and misogyny. So I think it's a lot of shit, in my opinion. Um, we don't have queer people of color at the bargaining tables. You know, the first queer person of color to lead an LGBT organization in Britain only happened three years ago. That was uh, Lady Phil, who is also the founder of UK Black Pride. Three years ago, first person of color to lead an LGBT organization. First major international LGBT organization was um, COC, and it's run by another black lesbian. She came into position, I think also around the same time, three years ago. COC um, in Netherlands is the oldest LGBT organization in history. I think they're about God, 80 years old or something. It's ridiculous, but you know the Dutch. Uh, but you know, I think it's terrible that even today, at board level, there are so few trans people, trans people of color, non-existent. Um, queer people of color, queer people from the diaspora, we don't get a look at. There was a conference last year, the Safe to Be Me conference, being hosted by the Conservative Party. And a bunch of white people had meetings with, a bunch of white queer people had meetings with the LGBT uh, uh, leads for the Conservative Party, Lord, <clears throat> What is his name? Anyway, you can look him up. He's the LGBT envoy for the Conservative Party right now, the Conservative government right now. And they they said, oh well, we're not we're, we're gonna drop out of the out of the conference because you don't support the trans ban, uh, the ban on LGBT people, you you've left out trans. I said, yeah, that's one issue, and I support it, but there's loads of other things going on around the world. And when did you consult us? There was no consultation. And then I, I challenged one white lesbian about it who, who, who said, oh no, we, we're supporting our trans siblings. I said, but they're not the only siblings. There's millions of us who are criminalized in the global south. What? What else? She said, oh, well, you know, we have to stick together. I said, yes, yeah, stick together. But you know, when you're having backdoor meetings and we're not invited, I am sticking together. And that's what's going on. And if you look at where we have come from the Stonewall riots of 1969 to today, the main beneficiary of LGBT rights has been white queer people. And I know people don't like me saying this, but I don't really give a shit. Okay. I'm fed up of it. <laughs> Sorry. Completely, completely. I do agree. And I know that you're like where this frustration coming from, because like people who are in the power, they're like sort of taking the decision for all those Commonwealth countries where never they visited. How do you like take decision for other people where you don't know anything about their culture, you don't know their suffering? So I think you are right. We should like empower those grassroots LGBTQ activists and take them on board and take the decision, future decision. However, like we name this conversation today is unfinished business, the voice of uh, regulations. So why do you think this is unfinished voice? What's need to be finished? What need to, we need to do more? Well, I mean, I, I don't think I'm, I'm the only person speaking out like this. I mean, obviously, I'm, I'm quite 
known because of what I achieved in China. Can I just say that I did my case completely independently? All of the white-led organizations in Britain refused to support my case. All of them. And they still could refuse to support my case now, even though my case is ongoing. I won at the High Court in 2018. That victory has been appealed by the Attorney General of Trinidad and Tobago, and it will be heard, heard at the Appeal Court next year in Trinidad and Tobago in October of next year. And then whoever loses that appeal will appeal to the Privy Council here, which is our Supreme Court. That judgment will be the first time that the Privy Council has ever heard an LGBT decriminalization case in its history, and it will have legal effect on 11 countries. So my judgment has the ability to decriminalize 11 countries across two continents. Not one LGBT organization in Britain supports me. Not one. I have to raise every penny myself, even though I and my lawyers work pro bono. So far, this case has cost over a million pounds. All of it has been pro bono work by me and my lawyers. And all the money that I have to pay, my photocopying bill alone for court was £4,000. Flying out my lawyers, my British team, I have British and Trinidadian lawyers, flying out my British team and appearing in court. Every time I appear in court, it costs me £15,000. I raise all of that money on my own. And not a single LGBT organization has supported me anywhere on this planet. So my question is that why do you think this LGBT organization, they are working for the community development, they are trying to help? Why? My question. I just because they have know. no vision, Max, because they have no vision. Yeah. This is this is what I, I said earlier. Yeah. People come to this with come, come to advocacy from desperation, not inspiration. If you are inspired, you can visualize something, you can dream something. You know, if you're desperate, you're on the back foot because you're always just responding to a stimulus. You're never creating stimulus yourself. And this is where advocacy is going so wrong. We don't have vision as queer people of what we want to see as our future. So, for example, when marriage equality came up, I said, you know, great, but let's not just talk about marrying your significant other, because for me as a queer man, I would love to give that power to a partner who is platonic. Because that relationship I know is gonna last my life. My best friend, I know, you know, Maz, I, we're gonna be best friends for life. So why didn't they say, instead of, oh, it's all romantic and lovey dovey and let's go to the get married at a big <laughs> castle in the country. Why don't we say as queer people, yes, romance is great, but we have other relationships. We have other families that we create. And let's, let's, let's give that to the straight people. How many straight women would like to say, you know what? I wish I could marry my girlfriend because men are dogs and she's going to be there for me. And if I get incapacitated and I need medical help or I need to, so I know I can trust her. That's, the, that's how you visualize it. That's how you dream beyond the patriarchy and misogyny and what all is already existing. And that's what queer people should bring to the table. We should bring these new ideas, but we're not. And it's because our leadership all went to Oxford and Cambridge and wherever else, and they just have been buying into a tried and trusted route by heterosexuals. Whereas those of us who are on the fringes of society, who don't have access to those kinds of things, who don't have access to tertiary education, who don't have access to middle-class lifestyles, who are people of color, who are trans, we don't have access to that no normality at all. That's not on our horizon at all. We don't have that in our, in our world. So what we have to do is, number one, broaden our boards. Make sure that people at the table designing these visions represent our community properly. I once went to, <laughs> I once went to an event in 2017. It was a coming together of all the LGBT organizations in Britain, and we're going to come together and create a, a, a fight for global LGBT rights. So I went to their big splashy launch, which was at a very dodgy accountancy firm, PwC, I think it was, somewhere in the city, and it was, you know, big gold kilted ballroom thingy. Do you know, at this thing, guess how many people of color were in a room of 300 people? 
Seven and a half. Because <laughs> I count. One of the first jobs I had when I came to Britain in 1985 was I used to count brown and black faces <laughs> attending events <laughs> funded by the local council. That was my job. I used to sit there with a clipboard and count black and brown faces. And I still do it now. And I, I want you to do it too. When you go to an event, count how many trans people are there. Count how many queer people of color are there. You know, and you will start to see what is wrong. Diversity and inclusion, where are these people at these events? Why don't they feel comfortable to come to them? So yes, I, I think that that's... Uh, thank you, Jason. And uh, for the audiences, we are going to take the question after a while. And um, definitely you will get a chance to ask questions. Yeah. Jason. Before that, I would like to sort of like introduce myself. Basically, Dan Glass, our favorite Dan Glass, he was supposed to chair the event. And finally, like he requested me to um, chairing the event. So um, another small speaker of the event, I am Maz Mazharul Islam, and I am one of the pioneer LGBTQ activists. And at the moment, I'm doing my master's uh, from King's College London and uh, global culture. At the same time, I'm working in a care sector because being an asylum applicant, I don't have right to work any other part, only I can work for the care sector. And on top of that, I'm like a trustee of the <coughs> Rainbow family and uh, a patron for the human rights organization called Report Out. So today I want to share my experience, how we did like sort of started LGBTQ activism back in Bangladesh. And it's not that far, uh, Bangladesh, once it was a part of Pakistan. Before that, it was like a part of Indian subcontinent. Again, in Bangladesh, there is this law 377 Penal Code, which is originated from the British colonial law. And it uh, criminalized homosexual. Uh, the punishment is lifetime imprisonment. So, Back in 2002, when we sort of like a few friends, I would say 12 of us, there was no platform for the Bangladeshi LGBT community in our country. And people used to sort of commit suicide and they didn't have any platform where they can go and talk. So we sort of created a small platform online platform, Yahoo group, with 12 people. And when I left Bangladesh in 2016, the group member was like 10,000. So that's how we became bigger in like 10 years time. And what we used to do, it's sort of, we used to organize small get together for the community people, small, like picnic. This is how we started just to build a platform. At that point, we didn't, even didn't know properly how we are going to get involved with the activism and everything. So later on, we were connected with the international organization like ILGA, then few embassy like US embassy and Danish embassy. They sort of like, uh, help us do some local project and survey in Bangladesh. That's how we are like growing. And in 2016, like uh, it was uh, one of my LGBT activist friend and another <coughs> LGBT activist was brutally murdered. It just because they published a magazine in Bangladesh and that was the, first uh, LGBT magazine, which was published. And that news was came to all the media and everything. The murder took place on 2016, 25th of April. And 
we, few of our friends were in the risk of our life. So US Embassy, my friend who was murdered, he used to work for the US Embassy. So he was sort of like immediately embassy create a shelter for the people whose life or in risk. So being an LGBT activist, I had I had to leave my country in 24 hour notice. Even I came to Yaput in a bulletproof car and I had only five minutes to meet my parents. And since I left the country, I couldn't go back. I couldn't meet my parents, nothing. And initially I was reallocated in Sri Lanka. I did like, mm, live still on kind hiding myself in different hotel for seven months. Then with the help of my previous organization, I moved to London in 2016, November. And after moving to London, uh, I didn't give up. I thought like my friend sacrificed their life and they should get the justice. So 2017, it was, at that point, I didn't know anyone that much. I had few family, as Jason mentioned that, like his uh, was, family was homophobically abused him. My brothers was not abused, but was not welcoming me. At some point, he sort of made, give me a choice either baby's house or just um, you have to leave your activism if you want to live with them. So I chose my activism, I left them. So that's the journey started in London. And as I told like in early 2017, I didn't know anyone. Uh, so only me and one of my friends uh, made a protest on, in front of like Trafalgar Square, making a placard asking justice for my friend uh, who were brutally murdered because they deserve justice. So later on, I was introduced to Dan Glass and Peter Tatchell. Then I sort of tell Peter, I definitely I want to make a protest in front of the Bangladesh High Commission and send this message to the Bangladesh government that like uh, we want justice for our friend. In 2018, from 2018 every year, I was staging a protest in front of Bangladesh High Commission asking justice for my friend and Jason were few times there in the event, Peter Tatchell in everyone. So that's sort of how I started my activism in United Kingdom. Then I started doing volunteer work with um, Gay Liberation Front, then ACT UP London, all this organization. And 2021, I sort of lost my job. Uh, I have been made redundant and I was living here in the work permit. So I couldn't go back to my country. So I had to claim asylum. And when I claim asylum, then I realized we are being treated not as human being, like <laughs> asylum seeker special categories people. I have worked in three different countries as a business development manager, and I have that skill and I can contribute to the economy through my skill. But right now I'm not entitled to work apart from the care sector job. That's how the law treat the asylum seeker people here. And I, I realized that when I claimed the asylum, I realized there is no platform. People like me who are coming from Bangladesh or South Asian region, they struggle to find the information. And then I thought, why don't I 
start an online group. So in last year, I started an online group called the Rainbow Tree. And it has got two parts, one part work for Bangladesh, another part work for the UK-based British Bangladeshi community. And you won't believe that how homophobic the British Bangladeshi community is right now. So we, this is an unfinished business where we need to work. And currently the rainbow tree is helping almost like six to seven people who claim asylum, who are a student as well. And uh, they moved to this country. Now they can go back to, it's because one of them were being raped and he couldn't like talk about it to anyone, none of you, his friends or family members, or he didn't even go to the police in Bangladesh because like if he goes, he would be arrested instead of like giving him any help. I myself was getting great threat. People are being like followed me and trying to blackmail me. I had to go to the police station and made a general diary where I couldn't mention that being homosexual, that's why I'm getting all this threat. So that's me and my journey about my activism plus being ended up in London. So from my experience, what I have learned that it's very important to create a good network because network is power. At the same time, if you want to work for the LGBT community, like just create awareness, first of all, like within your circle, then within your family, then within your society, then within your country. If you can't really accepted by your own family members, how do you expect the society will accept you? So that's the suggestion and advice from me. And we have half an hour time where we are going to take the question. So it's uh, now for you turn to ask the question to us. We are going to answer the question. Yes. Um, can we take the first from the audience and then online? Sure. Yeah. Okay, so we, we any questions from the audience? You want to be shy? Yeah, turn down, please, if it, so that we can hear you. Do you mind? Um, yes, if you can speak loud. I just you. have a question. How is it possible to decriminalize? Multiple countries at the same time. Sorry. Um, to I don't have the word decrim. Decriminalize. 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 Uh, multiple countries at the same time with the same. Oh, um, great question. Yeah. So the Privy Council um, is the Supreme Court for multiple former colonies of Britain. So my the laws are all the same. The law in Bangladesh is a British colonial buggery law. So these are all pretty much the same laws. Bangladesh doesn't come under the Privy Council because they're now a Muslim Sharia state. So they don't have the Privy Council. But any country that has the Privy Council as a Supreme Court, if my case wins, then that country, if they have a decriminalization case, that case automatically wins. So my case will have effect on 11 countries. All of the English speaking Caribbean and Mauritius, strangely enough. Mauritius has filed a decriminalization case and they will fall under my judgment of the Privy Council. Yeah, so, 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 um, uh, so just uh, sorry, I'm, I'm from Jamaica. Okay. Um, and Jamaica has a um, judicial committee and Privy Council at its apex court. Yes. Our constitutional framework is. Um, are deliberately quite different. Um, and so I would say that it isn't automatic that 
um, success in in um, your case yeah um, would mean um success in Jamaica. yeah well i mean jamaica is very strange in that they went into their constitution and they double ring fence the boundary law but why why it wouldn't have effect is uh caricom so you know if you have caricom as a whole decriminalization decriminalizing that is the the way that you can get jamaica to fall under CARICOM is, is like our EU. It's a it's a, a, a regional organization that pulls all of the uh, English speaking Caribbean together. Yes. What is your view of the, the future as um, like in the the diversity of uh, colored people and these actions uh, and in the LGBT uh, organizations as, as Say again. What is what, what is your view of the future of uh, oh. this problem? Yeah, no, I think it's a good question. Can I type in my one? Yes, one yes. Very similar. Okay. Like how do you see, uh, like, exactly countries that don't have private council, they don't have, how those countries are going to change their law, say, Uganda, Ghana, or how, how do you see that happening? The, is, is yes. To, like, how's the future? Yes. How do you see, because this is what the, uh, the idea of the series yes. was precisely to try to understand yes. how Africa Asian Middle East can actually. Yes. Then, I mean, this is exactly why I'm saying LGBT advocacy right now is, is crap, because it's so piecemeal that it looks at, oh, Commonwealth, let's look at that okay. uh, stand alone. And it's just like, well, you know, why are you not embracing countries like Bangladesh? You know, Bangladesh, I mean, I've been in talks with, with them about it. You know, decriminalization, what are the best routes? So, when we do our work in these little silos, you know, oh, well, this is North America, oh, this is Northern Europe, oh, this is Commonwealth, you know, there is no global work happening, right? People don't talk to each other. It's very territorial. And it's mainly because egos and there's very small pots of, of funding. So, everybody's fighting for the same money. So organizations don't work together. So you will have organizations here in Britain who are doing the exact same work, paying two people who are doing the exact same job, you know? And nobody talks to each other because it's so territorial. How do we get over that? I, I don't know, but right now it's, it's actually, you know, I feel for Bangladesh, which is why I, I, I work so closely with Maz and the asylum seekers from Bangladesh. I, I do a lot of asylum cases. I, I'm an independent expert on asylum, as some, some people in the audience know, um, because nobody is doing this work. Nobody is saying to the Home Office, oh, wait a minute, I know Maz. You know, we hang out in London. I know he's probably queer. I know he was chased by a murderous group who had just murdered two gay, uh, two gay friends of his in Bangladesh. I know him. I can vouch for him. They don't have those conversations. So it's, it's very disjointed. And uh, I don't know how to break through that. You know, when you look at a case like mine, you know, it's just like, I had, a, I had a, a lesbian recently tell me, Jason, people don't want to work with you. So, but they don't work with me now anyway. So what, what am I losing? <laughs> what the hell am I losing? <laughs> you know? And uh, it's, it's very difficult in the field to get things done. Very difficult. I mean, yeah. both Matt and I have had to start organizations because the big organizations soak up all the money. In 2018, at the Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting, which was here in London, uh, then Prime Minister Theresa May made a big speech. We apologize for the laws that we spread around the world, the homophobic laws, and we're giving 5.6 million pounds towards decriminalization to four British organizations. I don't know where the money has gone. <coughs> yeah. I don't know where that money has gone. They had a conference on decriminalization in Barbados. Nice. I wasn't invited. A person who decriminalized an entire country on their own, I was not invited to. And nobody knows where the 5.6 million is gone. So it's a nightmare. And you know, I'm really glad to be talking to young people like yourselves because I think it's kind of like that COVID thing. We need that break 
from that old guard who have been dominating queer activism. And it's mainly white people, it's mainly old white people, it's mainly conservative white people. I mean, we had the head of Stonewall, former head of Stonewall, who said it was more difficult for her coming out as a woman Catholic than coming out as a lesbian. <laughs> And, you know, again, you know, Stonewall does some great things, but oh my God, when they screw up, do they screw up? They had a raffle, right, to raise funds for their organization. And one of the prizes was a holiday to St. Lucia, which is a country that criminalizes LGBT people. <laughs> I, they, used to host, they used to host their ball, the Stonewall big ball they used to have was at the Dorchester, owned by whom? Yeah. The Qataris. <laughs> we know them. <laughs> so, you know, when you have a queer organization that is putting their foot in it that much and not even willing to learn, you know, when the rest of us say, um, you know, this is wrong, St. Lucia is a country of criminalizers, you shouldn't be sending queer people there. They just say, oh, you know, we're, we're raising money. It's about an important way. Not even acceptance. Okay, hands up, we got this wrong. Because there's so many egos at play here. So many egos, yes. Um, actually, those questions, but I'll start with one that leads quite nicely on from yours in regards to the World Cup. And I'm just asking because it's one of the biggest things that have come out of it. And I guess the question is that because you could say, well, yes, you know, if we're talking about LGBTQ plus rights, um, that's an issue, but it's also not the only issue. There will be loads of World Cups around the world where different groups of people are going to be um, oppressed or oppressed. And so I guess what's your opinion on it and, and how would you sort of moving forward if look at how that would change towards the future? And I just want to check, Maz, are people online hearing questions? Everybody's okay hearing? Are you hearing? Yes? Maz, you're on mute. I want that on a t-shirt. <laughs> Thank you. Are you hearing any questions from the, from the crowd audience? Mm. Yes? Okay. And, and people online, Please do do fire in your questions online. I, I think there's a is this Zoom? So it's a normal yeah, Zoom. Yeah, yeah. Mas can read yeah. them. Okay. okay. Mas, can yes. read. Uh, we have got one question. If oh, wait, hold on, Mas. Let me just answer wait. this one here. This one. Sure. Okay. Um, I think there is nuance to everything, and there isn't one route to equality and freedom. You know, I always tell people. You know, I, what I am doing is litigation through the courts. It's very costly. It's very costly emotionally. I mean, I've lost practically all of my friends, practically all of my family. You know, I mean, that's what get, gave me the freedom to do this because I would never have done this and put my family in danger. I mean, both me and my have fatwas on our head. Trinidad has the um, highest number of ISIS recruits in the Western Hemisphere. Trinidad and Tobago, my country. So I've heard that there's a fatwa on my head. I also heard the Roman Catholics want my head on a spike as well. Mm. But you know, this is dangerous work. So I don't, I don't say to everybody, oh yeah, go and do this, go and do that. You know, it's very dangerous work for some of us. You know, Mass's friends were brutally murdered. Um, uh, 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 David Cato in Uganda hacked to death in his home in 2012. So there are nuances and there's different routes and we must find different routes. And when somebody does something that may not be to your liking, you know, let them get on with it. Keep your head down and get on with what, what you're doing, you know? And also I think we don't imbue the small things with enough power. I'm very much about peer-to-peer -peer work. So when you come to an event like this and you've met me and Maris and you know that, listen, you know, they're, they're there's these two queer men who are doing this stuff in these far away lands. What you need to come out of this room and do is when you hear your friend or your family member being homophobic, pull them up and say, no, 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 not on my watch. We don't speak about queer people like that. 
All right. That is important work. It's equally as important as my litigation. That's where change really happens. True transformation happens face to face. When you leave this room, if you can take this message out to just one person in your classroom, you know, make the, those people aware that these are lives at stake, <laughs> that it's serious business happening out in the world. Gay men being thrown off buildings in Syria. That's happening today. Lesbians being murdered in Russia. <coughs> Gay men being tortured and murdered in Chechnya. That's all happening today. So do the little things as equally powerful. Standing up to, to your racist grandparents, you know, yeah, that's important. The Qatar thing, I mean, the guy that did the teacher thing yesterday, amazing, amazing. For me, that was the Rosa Parks of football. I thought it was utterly brilliant. And the fact that he's now getting death threats shows you the power of something that small. If you read Twitter today, people are calling for him to be beheaded. So yeah, that T-shirt worked. Actually, Spain did this. Right? And, you know, I may disagree a lot with Peter Tatchell, but we have to be very clear about the work that's happening in countries. That work has to be led by people from or within those countries. Right. Yes, Pat, is your question online? Yes, uh, we have got a question from <clears throat> Sheikh Shiraz MD Asker. So basically he wanted to know, like, do you think with the homophobic faith, Islam is strictly followed by the people in the Muslim country, decriminalization can be expected in recent future. Do you want to like uh, take the question? Then I will add. I mean, I, I've spoken to lawyers. I'm, I'm very lucky. I have access to a lot of major law firms in the city of London. For some reason they like me, I don't know why. But I mean, these are billion dollar law firms. My, my, my law firm, Paul Hastings, who have been utterly brilliant and was the first law firm to come on board. They've spent over 450,000 pounds on my case, pro bono work on my case. And Paul Hastings is a huge billion dollar law firm, global billion dollar law firm. And this was the first time that they'd ever gotten into doing pro bono human rights work around LGBT. So that's where the work needs to start. On, on countries that have Sharia law, because of course, Sharia law is a very different kettle of fish. And to get in there, to get in there with the lawyers, you have to get in with the lawyers. And how you do that is those countries are not isolated, all right? With the exception of the very wealthy Middle East countries and North Korea, Countries are not isolated. They do business with the city of London. They do business in Paris. Billions and billions and billions of dollars worth of business. So we need those businesses to say, oi, you wanna do business with us? Get rid of that law. <coughs> Otherwise, it's gonna be very tough doing business with us. That's the leverage. You've gotta use money. Money speaks in this work. And also political leverage. Right? I mean, I saw a statement from, from Richie Sunak today saying, oh, the honeymoon is over with China. When was there a honeymoon with China? When? I mean, how many people have been massacred? Uyghurs massacred. When was the honeymoon with China? Thank you very much. So how human rights, how you leverage human rights through the dollar and through political persuasion is key. And we're not doing enough of that. And it's because our parliamentarians are lazy. And a lot of them, beyond lazy, they're homophobic and racist themselves. So what are we going to do? We have a, a new generation coming up, which I am so hopeful for, because I meet people like you guys, you folks, who are really keen to build a different world. You know. And thank 
heavens, I see this. It's the only thing that keeps me going. Because the old guard, I've written them off. You know, people, people 40 and over, my God, what a waste of time are you? What are you doing to this planet? I mean, the, the intersectionality of climate change and queer liberation. I speak this in rooms and they look at me like, what are you talking about? And I don't you realize that the first communities that are going to be hit by climate change are the minorities. The trans woman who is a sex worker, right? She's going to be hit first. And she has no safety net. In Trinidad and Tobago, over 90% of trans women are sex workers, and over 50% of them are HIV positive. So in at the height of the pandemic, I managed to raise 20,000 pounds to be able to feed them and get them their medication because they were in lockdown, so they couldn't go to the clinics and collect medication. Where were the organizations doing this work? Why was it left to me? And I'm trying to you know, keep this plate spinning. So there's so much that needs to happen. But you know, we all just need to do our, our little bit. Exactly. And I just wanted to highlight one of your point that like, you mentioned that you really love this new generation. And if I go back to the question who was asking whether is it uh, like going to be decriminalized homosexual in recent future, the country like Bangladesh perspective, I can answer, no, it's not going to take place overnight. It's need to take, like from my, perspective gonna take maybe in next 30, 40 years, because it's for not only just religion, it's also politics involved here. So people <laughs> who are in the power, they are like homophobic people. Those generation needs to get out of from the power and the new generation, our gen, not even our generation, generation Z should come to the power. They would be more liberal and then the changes will take places. So I, 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 I disagree, Bas. I think it's gonna happen faster. I think what you're forgetting, because you're 40 and over, is that our <laughs> new people have access. Younger people have access. You all have access, instant access to information that our generation could not have imagined. You all live online, you all live digitally, and that world is not the world that you and I and our parents and our grandparents know about and our politicians. They are all dinosaurs. So I think we are going to see things move a lot faster. And I think with globalization, countries like Bangladesh, you know, simple thing like the clothes you're wearing. Bangladesh is one of the largest producers of clothes. I think probably half of you tonight are wearing something that was made in Bangladesh. That's where you hit them. That's where you hit them. But you don't also fight just for LGBT. And this comes to your point about Qatar. You don't fight for just LGBT. You must fight for all human rights. So you must fight for freedom for women in Bangladesh. You must fight for workers' rights in Bangladesh. You must write, fight for the proper payment of the work, workers in Bangladesh and then LGBT alongside of it. That's where intersectionality is important and where the work needs to happen. So for example, with my work in Trinidad, what came out of my case after I won was a load of straight people saying, you could take your country to court I didn't know. So then I got all these straight people coming to me to say, oh, do you know how I can decriminalize marijuana? I said, yeah. <laughs> so you have to not live your advocacy in a silo. Yes, my advocacy is very centrally LGBT, but I'm also you know, very vocal about race. I'm very vocal about women's rights. I'm very vocal about <clears throat> human rights as, as a general, and climate change is also a big thing on my parade. But you have to work with all of these things at the same time and be cognizant of how they all interact with each other. Yes, yes. I, I do agree with you. But here is a, one of the problem, lack of the leadership. And yes. we don't have that resources to create this 
global pressure on the government. If we had that, when the government see that my economy is going to break down, they will definitely take that, but still we long way to go. Um, I'm afraid that we might take one more question uh, from the audiences. Then uh, we have uh, maybe time for another two questions. Okay. Is that okay? Yes. Okay. This one, we have one in, in, in here, and so then we do the one online. Uh, there is no question online. I, I don't see any more question in online. So, audiences in person, they get the. Okay. We have two. Two, two, two more questions here. Yeah, sure. We'll, we'll take the two more questions, and answer should be answered within four minutes. <laughs> that is quite quick. I was just wondering, you spoke of an activism um, out of desperation, and I'm wondering, it sort of sounds like um, I'm hearing this activism out of inspiration that maybe is happening. And um, could you maybe, am I correct in understanding that you feel the new generation maybe has a possibility to lead an activism by inspiration rather than desperation? I mean, I, I, Great question. I think um, the gender identity issue that's happening now is something that's very inspired. And it wasn't kind of coming out of, oh, I'm desperately escaping something. It was young people saying, oh, wait, I'm non binary. I don't choose to buy into that binary identity. And I think that's very inspired, you know? So I'm, I'm seeing it happening for sure. I mean, Greta Thunberg, I mean, that's inspiring. And she wasn't desperate, you know, which white girl in Sweden, you know, and she's just like, wait, I care about the planet. That's inspired. Um, Malala, who I had the honor of meeting this July in Birmingham at the opening of the Commonwealth Games, what she's doing right now is inspired. So yeah, young people definitely <coughs> much more inspiration than desperation. And again, when we, when I talk about the lack of diversity and inclusion at the board tables and the decision making process, young people aren't there either. So it's not just you know people of color who are being ignored and trans people. Young people are nowhere on those tables. I'm like, you know, what are you going to do when you shuffle off? You know, who's going to take your space? So that's also really important as well. So we are going to take the last question now. So please go ahead. Yes, so, uh, so, so the question is for you actually, Max. Oh. All right, okay. Yes, so I've, um, I've had, had the, I'd say the privilege of, of seeing um, advocacy groups um, in, in various jurisdictions in the Anglophone Caribbean doing um, critical work um, for um, for their communities, work which is um, perhaps um, unseen elsewhere. Um, uh, do you um, can you think of or can you point to work being done by groups um, in Bangladesh, which um, we would necessarily um, be able to see? Uh, do you mind repeating the question or last part? What? Uh, sorry, I didn't catch it. Yeah, so, so, so I'm asking if um, there is work that you know of or that you're perhaps involved in from a distance um, in, in Bangladesh, valuable work um, for um, queer communities that we may not have, um, have the opportunity to see, which you could perhaps tell us a little bit about. Well, uh, so, in terms of like Bangladesh perspective, um, what queer community it's like, I would, I'd like to give you a like overview of the current situation of Bangladesh that might help you. So we saw the from 2002 till 2016, we developed this queer community and uh, we are like, pioneer LGBT activists in Bangladesh. We are like being visible and we are like being vocal. We are trying to write article in different uh, newspaper, all this. And when the murder took place, everything, the entire generation of the first queer community had to leave the country. And we had to like, we again went back to the 20 years before where we were been 
and it's more worse than that situation currently because no one, the murder took place in 2016, but the fear is still there. So it would be completely different scenario. Right now, what we are trying to do, we are trying to work in sort of like underground, building the community, making the like leadership who can lead the country's next generation to, and also trying to make an international bridge between Bangladeshi LGBT community and within No, 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 I think it's his connection. Uh, sometimes it happens when, um, let me see. There's not much I can do about this yeah it's a shame because obviously he was trying to sort of um yeah he, he was talking the yeah he's probably had to go, uh, go off uh, this was right right yeah uh, we, we don't have to end on the top of 6 30 if you have any other questions yeah, that, that, that's what i wanted to say that uh, yes we you 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 can be like around a little bit it's just that we had the time in until Right. There was some confusion there, okay. uh, but uh, I think I think we lost mass by yes. the look of it, didn't we? Unfortunately, uh, but he was uh, yeah he was making some final comment because I think he also had to go maybe at six thirty, and uh, so yeah so you are uh, based, yeah we can just say goodbye to the online audience, shall we? Yeah. Uh, ah there is there is hold on hold on hold on so yeah let's uh, mass hi. Are you back? Good, good, excellent. So you can make some final comments as you were say, as you were doing. Uh, can you hear us? Yeah, sorry, your the last minute your connection uh, went. Um, <laughs> I mean, that's the thing with the Zoom like, technology. Honestly, right. I was somehow disconnected. Privacy gone. I I was disconnected. So, yes, I was disconnected. So, yes, I hope. It did answer the question. If not, you can just simply write an email to me. I got the email address from, um, you can collect it from Angelica. I'll get back to you. And we just need to say right the goodbye. And Angelica, would you mind just give a note of thanks? And we, especially from um, me and Jason, are really grateful having this platform to the Swartz University and letting our voice to be heard. Yes, absolutely. No, no, thank you. I mean, I just uh, uh, want to, yeah, I could say maybe a few words just to uh, say that how grateful we are to be able to have this conversation with people like you, because even today, uh, to be fair, my mind has been open even more uh, in the sense of like understanding uh, what Jason was talking about, also all the, um, you know, uh, yeah, it's idea that actually diversity inclusion, you know, they are like big words, but people don't actually practice it in their daily life. And this is something that for me is really like very important because um, exactly we're talking about human rights. I didn't say we, we, and everybody, we want everybody to be included and be part of, but unfortunately out there in the real world, there's always these power structures, as you said, you know, whether it's money, and, and it's kind of sad as well to kind of hear it from you because exactly you will feel people that had already struggled, you know, will be people that would be more open-minded, but sometimes actually that's not the, and as you said, sometimes also is generational, 
uh, because of the history that uh, you know sort of older generation have to bear and that they, they can't you know be free from from all those uh, so it's been extremely inspiring and this is just the uh, um, this is the third event in the series okay uh, yeah so it's the start there uh, only and uh, we are really open with Dan a glass of which is not yet tonight because uh, if you see that is a such an inspirational person actually uh, as well as you all of you and uh, so the idea would be to just keep talking keep uh, having this conversation because we feel uh, in SOAS especially we feel that you know we're talking about Africa, Asia, Middle East regions that are very geographic far from us and uh, but we really you know we should do more we should have because we are people that are connected from our diasporas our students, our academics, there is so much more that we could actually do to influence. And, and these are just a small part, very small part in an event. But as Jason said, even to me, it was a very inspirational because it's true. Sometimes just speaking to one person, or you know, it can actually make a difference. So I hope like now we all gonna go out there in the real world and just you know be encountered by so many different situations that we have to stand up for. We really have to say, you know what is right and if you are uh, witnessing if you're part you can't be complacent you can't be complicit mm -hmm. you have to say you have to fight you know and yeah sometimes as uh, jason said it can be scary it can be daunting but you know the new generation as we keep saying is like you know we need to push the boundaries basically and that is a sort of my final comment uh, so if maz and jason you want to say some a, a couple of final final comments uh, yes. before we say bye to um to Maz, unfortunately, Maz, you want to Maz is gone. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's a good. So I leave it to you to yeah, end. To wrap it up. Well, I end on some exciting good news. Um, Singapore just decriminalized today. Um, wow. <laughs> there, just a couple of hours ago, um, their law was also similar to Southeast Asia 377. A, so exactly the same British colonial era buggery law. Now, the interesting thing about this case, which I would highlight to you, is a group of activists took the country to court, similar to me, but they had a lot more money and a lot more support and a lot more, 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 and they lost. They lost at every level of court in Singapore, including at their Supreme Court. So why would they decriminalize today? I think it's about... It's about six months after they lost to the Supreme Court. Again, that loss of the Supreme Court showed Singapore very badly in the international community. Their business partners thought, really? You're criminalizing your LGBT people and using a, a, with a law that dates back hundreds of years that was British? So the premier of Singapore, realizing that there was this backlash you know, on just what Singapore looks like internationally. This isn't like prime ministers calling up each other up. This is just how the international community perceives Singapore as a nation, which is again, what's happening to Qatar. How Qatar is being viewed now as a nation is much more powerful. So I'm glad they can't have the World Cup thing because it's showing them up for their human rights abuses. But similarly in Singapore, after losing at the Supreme Court, the international community went, Really, you're a modern progressive society. I am too sure about that. So they have unilaterally decriminalized through their parliament today. So, oh, man, it's time, I yes. I just want to tell you, everyone, if you really want to make a positive change, then just do and what is right just and always stand for yourself and your friends. Do the right thing. That's your small contribution. If we everyone do the right thing, that's going to bring a huge change in the world. So if you ever see anyone in front of you being abused sexually or racism, stand by themselves and raise your voice. That's my request to everyone. Thank you.
Say bye, Matt. So say bye, bye to you now. Bye. Bye, online audience as well. Thank you so much. Bye. Don't keep on.